The Dead Pair Podcast is brought to you by Elite Shotgun. They stand behind and you. And fueled by Fioki. Oh. Welcome to the Dead Pair Podcast. Coming in hot with hot. everything you want to hear about sporting plays. Ben Hathaway. He's sure a blind person would have to fight 14 kangaroos. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get Anthony on the phone. You're making a big mistake, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, we're talking Gianna Santo tonight. Well, I have something, but I don't know how much everyone's going to like it. I was not ready for that. With your hosts, Jason Rambo. You just didn't want my wife to edit something else you did. And Sean Alley. You gotta keep it PG-13, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Often imitated, but never duplicated. It's the Dead Pair Podcast. The Dead Pair. And now, it's showtime. What's up, everyone? Welcome back. Welcome back, Mr. Large and in Charge. Oh, what's happening, Jason? Well, I am very excited because we have a very dear friend of ours. Mr. Don Pageant is with us from the very start of the show. What's up, Don? Hey, not much, guys. How's it going? We're good, doing great, good. Don. How about yourself, man? Uh, if life is any better, I'd have to be twins so I can enjoy it twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> nice. that, I just uh, don't think the world could handle two of me. <laughs> how's that Tennessee weather treating you? Oh, it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. I hope you're busting clays off those Atlas traps. <laughs> you know it. Ah, there we go. A little sponsor plug right off the rip. What do you <laughs> right? think? What's your, uh, what's your next big shoot coming up, Don? Uh, I've got a Ducks Unlimited shoot coming up next weekend. And the Night Stalker, and then the Ohio State Championship. Sweet. Well, we'll Very nice. we can't wait to see you down up here. Uh, I can't wait either. I love shooting up there. Well, um, we're going to dive into Don and our whole show for the night, but Sean, get started with, we have a tourney talk to get to. Yes, we do. Give me one second here. It's tourney talk. <laughs> Brought to you by Score Chaser. Okay, this isn't really a tournament, but the Longbird Shortbird at Defender Clay Sports, June 1st and 2nd, just opened for registration. Uh, Keynotes here, the shoot was over 250 participants in 2022 and top 300 in 2023. Uh, Not a state shoot again, but it's a big one. Uh, Maybe check that out. It is on Score Chaser if you're interested. And then last but not least, the New Hampshire State opened up. It's going to be June 8th through the 9th, uh, 2024 at the 20th Skeet and Clays. Also, this is last minute, um, Tiger Holt benefit shoot at Denham Springs, Louisiana. Uh, guys and gals, this is last minute. It is this Saturday, May the 4th. Um, this is a very important benefit shoot. Uh, the family is part of the shooting community. They're in some trouble. They need some help. Um, so if you can't make it and you'd like to donate, uh, contact Paige Miller at 225 225- three zero five four two seven nine um anything you can do to help would be greatly greatly appreciated again that's this saturday uh may the 4th at uh riverside sporting clays in denham springs louisiana that's riverside sporting clays in denham springs louisiana um like i said uh, this family is part of our shooting community they need our help. They're down on their luck. They could really use some help. So uh, anything you can do um, to help out would be greatly appreciated. That's it, guys. Very nice. Hey, speaking of big shoots, let's not forget about the Dead Pair Blast, December 4th through the 8th down at Vero Beach uh, Clay Shooting Sports. Hope to see everyone there. Um, Sean Alley, we're still slowly but surely adding to the clubs and coaches page on our website. That's starting to build. Yes, we are. Yep, a lot of people are jumping on board now, and that's good. Hopefully, that's helping them out. Uh, if you are a listener, you're looking for a coach, you're looking for a club, traveling abroad, check out our website and uh, check them out. There's all kinds of info on there, all kinds of uh, coaches. Hopefully, we can get you hooked up with somebody good and uh, make it worth your while. So tonight, the whole premise of this show is back in time. And, you know, we, Sean and I were talking and it was like, you know, what will we do different coming up? Um, Don, I'm sure you've probably beat your head against the wall a few times. Like Sean and I had It's like, man, what was I thinking? Right. So let's absolutely, it's a good thing that they were our drywall walls. (laughs) (laughs) Um, let's kind of kick this off, Sean. Um, you know, if you think back. Not even to when we started registered, maybe even before that. 
but let's let's we got a few topics down here. One of them uh, that you wrote down is I wouldn't chase punches at all. Um, that's getting started into the tournament world. But look, can we go back a little farther before we started yeah. shooting tournaments? What do you think you would have done different? Well, I mean, it depends on how far back you want to go. That's the big question. So if we go back to the days when I first got started with you and your dad going out and hitting some of the local clubs, of course, at that time, your dad was shooting registered targets, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, but we were just back then, though, we didn't know. We barely could figure out which end of the shell to stick in a gun. Um, right, right. I, I guess, I, listen, okay, Marty McFly, climb into your DeLorean, rev up that flex capacitor, Let's I'm go. Revving. Let's go back to about like fifteen, fourteen when we were shooting at Cardinal just for fun. Mm-hmm. What would you have done different to try and get better? Uh, well, gosh, there's so much, Jason. So much. Uh, number one, I didn't even know what I was doing wrong at the time. So obviously, a coach would probably be my first suggestion. Um, having somebody show you the ropes as a new shooter is probably your fastest shortcut to getting good. You you don't know how to read targets. You don't know proper mechanics. You don't know how to move the gun properly. Uh, things like hold points, break points. I mean, most people go out and shoot. I mean, let's face it. Most of us grew up as, as hunting people. We went out, shot bunny rabbits and birds and deer and that kind of stuff. Um, and you really don't necessarily practice shooting mechanics as much. It's, it, it's just you either hit it or you don't. But when you're doing sporting clays, there's so much involved in your form, your stance, how you hold the gun. I mean, if you have a coach, literally, it. Can, I mean, just having one or two lessons to get you over that hump and kind of start your brain thinking in the right direction, that's going to save you, I, I would say, if not months, maybe even a year or more of learning on your own. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, Don, what's your take on that? Go back to before you started shooting you know, registered, what would you, what would you have done different just even at the basic level? But the DeLorean actually landed in the same time frame because it was probably about 2015. I started shooting. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I would have done differently is exactly what you said, Sean is, is I would have, I would have found a good coach and good coach is a key word there. You got to be careful who you work with, find somebody that is, going to be able to take you through quite a few levels that knows you and will enhance what you have and change what you're doing wrong. So definitely I would have done that because, you know, back then you're just getting started in the sport. You're, you're, you're careful about where you spend money and what you spend it on. And it just, you tend to believe and listen to anybody that you shoot with. And that's a big mistake. Be careful who you listen to, be careful you know, who you actually get your lessons from, make sure it's somebody reputable in the industry uh, that's actually gotten somewhere. Um, that's my suggestion. So, yeah, that would have saved me a ton of time. Well, I would completely agree with that. I mean, you know, don't misunderstand me, everyone. I mean, my biggest my biggest learning I've ever done is coming from my mistakes, whether it's in shooting, life, work, whatever, right? But the amount of money we could have saved and the shortcut, the only shortcut in this game, I think all three of us will agree as a coach. I, th- in fact, yep. I don't think anybody would disagree with this, you know, that, that shoots tournaments. Um, so, okay, Sean, let's go back to your original statement here. You said you wouldn't chase punches at all. What do you mean by that? Explain that. Well, so as a new shooter, there's a lot of things you don't know. Uh, you know, not only, you know, form function, how to read targets, how to understand uh, the type of shooting that you're doing, whether it's, you know, pull away, sustained lead, uh, swing through. I mean, there's just so much you have to learn. But the natural, I think the natural thought to anybody getting into the game is, well, I want to get at the top of the game. You know, I want to, I don't want to be the beginner guy. I want to be, you know, the advanced guy, the master class guy or whatever. So, you know, the NSCA has set up the system to where in order to move forward, you have to gain punches. And when you gain a certain amount of punches, that's what pushes you up into the next class above where you start. And back when we started, Jay, it was uh, we were actually in E class, if I remember correctly, that was still we were still starting off in E class. Yeah. Uh, These days, everybody starts off in D. Um, 
Let me just go ahead and let me let me go ahead and summarize what Sean is saying. We were both punch drunk. Yeah, absolutely. We thought that was the most important thing about shooting registered tournaments is going to a tournament and earning punches. Well, that makes and three boy, of us. Boy, boy, were we all wrong, right? I mean, come on, Dan, Don. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that makes three of us. Yeah, yeah, I was totally intoxicated with punches. I mean, it was so bad that we actually measured our own success at a tournament, whether or not we got a punch. Yeah, I mean, and when you're at a small, smaller tournament, let's say 100 to 150 people, there might only be 20 in your class, and a third place, only a target or two behind, and not getting a punch, it's still a successful tournament by some level of major right i mean but we we totally thought we were failures if we didn't get a punch and i think right. that is total wrong mentality i agree absolutely i i think uh punching up too fast isn't a good thing i mean i ended up in master class uh way sooner than what i should have and because i was chasing punches i i should have stayed down lower enjoyed the the sport more but it takes some of the enjoyment out of it when you're chasing the punches like sean said yeah, absolutely. And I and I just want to make it clear. Now, I wasn't shooting sub-gauge and, and just chasing punches to chase punches. I was shooting actual tournaments, you know, whether it was a regular main event or a super sporting or fee task or something like that. That's how I earned my punches to get where I was. But I want to say, I want to say that uh, the other point that I was going to make is the fact that um, the other thing was we never thought we were good enough to go shoot some of the bigger tournaments. Amen to that. You know, it was like we we aren't good enough to to deal with uh, to deal with going to the Ohio State shoot. We're not good enough to go to a regional. We're not good enough to travel out of state yet. And and you know that's exactly why the classes exist with the NSCA. You're shooting against people that are fairly competitive, fairly in the same league as your shooting abilities. And I mean, it, it's about as fair as it can be. And that was just another big thing. I, I wish I could have gone back and shot an Ohio State shoot or regional in D class or C class. You know, I just, I didn't start shooting. I think Ohio state, I started shooting when I was in C class and then I did the regional the year after Jay, I think that was, that was what it was. Wasn't it? Yeah. We shot state I, one year and then we did the regional the year after. Well, we did. Yeah. I think we shot state in 18 and then the state was a two year. Both. Yeah. The state was a two year bid at Cardinal at that time. We shot our first state and then the second year, the state came again but then also Cardinal had won the Northeast Regional that year. And then That's, we finally decided yeah. to go shoot a regional. That's correct. Don, how about you? Did you um did you hold back a little bit from going to big from big tournaments? Did you keep yourself from going? Do you regret yeah, yeah, that? For the same philosophy, you know, I thought, well, I gotta get better before I go to these big tournaments and start shooting. And I've been telling my students, no, go. I don't care if you're in D class go because you're going to get to see the big boy targets you get to see a lot more people build more relationships and you've always got the the vendors and everybody that are there it's just the excitement the camaraderie and everything at a major shoot is amazing absolutely amazing well and and here's the thing about attending these bigger shoots regardless of how you do it's a growth and learning opportunity and right i don't think I mean, you know, one, the targets are bigger, uh, the environment, like Don said, you know, I mean, the vendors and everything else that's there at these bigger shoots. But I mean, you really need to go out and shoot some of these big targets if you're going to get better. If you think visiting your local club and shooting the same monthly tournaments over and over again is going to make you a, you know, some kind of awesome shooter or something, I, I disagree. I think you need to spread your wings a little bit. If you, if you really want to grow as a tournament shooter, you've got to go to bigger shoots. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you talk to people about going to the big, bigger shoots, I, I always tell them, expect your score to drop 20%. That's just a rough oh, yeah. guess. Rough guess. Oh, yeah. But you've got these people that go to a regional shoot. First time they've ever gone to a major shoot, they go to a regional shoot. They normally shoot in the low 90s at a benefit shoot, and they go there and shoot in the upper 50s, lower 60s. And they say, I hate these targets. I hate coming to these things. I'm not going back. It's because they didn't know what to expect. But instead of looking at your score, look at your score compared to other people in your class. That's how you know how well you did. Yep. I agree. I agree. And don't be discouraged. You're learning. You're building a whole new database of targets. And you're not going to have near as much fun. I think it came out of one of the uh, 
stations with a one out of six. And I come out of it laughing and smiling because I laughed at the target sitter because he beat me. I loved it. I got one. <laughs> well, I know before our first target, just to go on the way back machine, or, or our first tournament, I should say, Jason and I, I mean, we're, we're pretty good shooters. We've been hunting a lot and, and we, sh we shoot clays, you know, at that time for fun. And we thought, do really good at our first tournament. And I think we were, we barely broke 50 birds, our first tournament, right, Jay? Uh, no. No? Between me, you, and JD, all, all, I don't remember who shot what, but there was like a 40, a 41, a 42. Yeah, it was pretty low. Pretty low. Yeah. And, and we're like, wow, these are these are way different targets than what we've been shooting at the at the local club. <laughs> yeah, I remember I remember going to the clubhouse and asking the girl if she could take my name off of registration because I was so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, good, but good but you know what though? I mean, here's the thing that also sparked a fire. And I say I'm bringing JD into this because it was just us the three musketeers at the time, me, Sean, and JD. Right. And it sparked a fire in us, and we were eight up from that from that very first tournament. We were eight up, and it was two things were very very evident. Number one, we had a lot of work to do, and number two, we were hooked. Oh yeah. Right? Oh, so yeah. and and that got us going. And you know, looking back now, I mean, it's wow how far we've came. Um. Sean, you got another thing written down here. It says, I would have worried more about my own score uh, and, and my competition less. Now, Don just alluded to how did you do in your class, but you're saying, no, you would have just worried about your own score? Yeah. So, and Jason, I know you're aware of this too because you were guilty of it as well. So, when you get kind of in your group, in your class, uh, it seems like if you're a decent shooter, if you're towards the top, if you're in that you know, top 10, 20%, you're always battling the same people. If you're shooting locally, that is, and I'm talking about us shooting in Ohio. Uh, there's always like uh, four five, six people that you shoot against. And they always seem to be like, right, you know, nipping right on your heels or you're nipping at their heels in each tournament. And I think, you know, and it used to frustrate me sometimes. And I know Jay, it, it happened to you as well, but it's like, you know what? You really need to be honest with yourself. It matters not what anybody else in your class is shooting. Whether they shoot a 90 and you shoot a 60 or you shoot an 80 and they shoot a 30, it doesn't matter. It's all about you and how you are shooting that day. Don't worry about what anybody else does because if you worry about that, it just, again, I think it kind of takes some of the joy out of the game at that point, if that makes sense. Well, let me let me jump in here before Don says anything. I'll just tell you right now, first of all, I'm guilty of a lot more than just that, but... Um, <laughs> It, when you and I shot together, Sean, we were always, we always finished one bird apart. Oh yeah. Yep. And that's, uh, you know, and it was hard for me, but that's when I finally was like, look, dude, I'm sorry, but I'm shooting with somebody else. I had to, I had to just go shoot and see what I could do. I mean, cause if I missed a target that you hit, I felt like I should have hit that and vice versa. You did the same thing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's like, cause we're, we, you know, it's, and it's like, no, you need to go do your best. Who cares what somebody else did? So what about you, Don? Did you kind of get in that same mindset, that same groove there for a while? Yeah, I, I did. Uh, and, and I still do it to this day. And unfortunately, you know, there's a group of people in Tennessee that I, I'm consistently, like you said, just like Ohio, you know, that you're right there with them. And then you go to a major shoot or you go to a different shoot and all of a sudden you drop four or five targets below. I don't get discouraged anymore. I used to, but you know, people have good days and people have bad days. Right. And I think that's what you're alluding to, Sean. Don't let it discourage you and upset you to the point where you don't go back for a couple of weeks. Um, just, you know, the whole point of this sport is fun. Right. And that's what I try to tell about. It's supposed to be fun. And when, when it, the fun comes out of it, you're doing something wrong. Um, so I, I, I totally agree, but I do tend to take a look at the ones that I'm normally close to, to see how I did in comparison to them. And that lets me know what I need to work on and what I need to do, whether it be fee tasks or five stand or whatever the it is, you know, maybe I need to do something a little bit different, work on my mount in fee tasks or, or something like that. Um, so I'm always analyzing, looking at it. Yep. No, I, I agree with that totally. Um, Sean, you got here, and, and this is why I really like this one. 
Uh, you said I would have spent more time hanging out after the shoot instead of rushing home. Uh, I think somebody told you this. I, this is where I'm going to throw out. I told you so. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, and that's a big thing that I think most shooters, um, you know, let's, let's put it this way. If you're a new shooter, obviously you have a lot of anxiety about going somewhere you've never done, done a tournament before. You know, you don't really know anybody. And I'll tell you what, I mean, as we've all learned, and I think we'll all agree on this, the the Sporting Clays community is probably some of the best people you'll find anywhere. And, you know, there's so many opportunities to make friends. I mean, Jason, Don, you guys have made friends all over, and, and I have too. Um, but not knowing that back in the day, it was just the mindset of, well, I'm going to go shoot my tournament. All I'm worried about is my score, and then I'm going to go home and you know, get to my chores or do whatever I got to do, or, you know, we're, we're going to go out and have lunch or whatever, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, part of the enjoyment of the sport is the the brotherhood, the camaraderie. And it's really nice to be able to hang around and talk about the shoot after the shoot. I know Jason and, and I, uh, especially with doing the podcast nowadays, you know, we really enjoy hanging out, talking to all the shooters, talking to all the the pros, the coaches, the the staff at the club, uh, and just discussing the sport in general, uh, people that are just as passionate, if not more so, than we are. Uh, Don, what's your thought on that? Absolutely. You know, I always, when I first started in this sport and started going to some of the big shoots, you know, where the, where the pros are, I was always scared to approach them. Mm-hmm. You know, th- this is their world. This is their job. Uh, you know, I didn't want to stop and talk to them. But I found out the more I started approaching, the more I started talking to them the more I found that this sport was amazing. And just for that reason, when I go to a major event, usually I won't squad with people I know on purpose. I'll squad with strangers simply because it's a great way to just get to know people. And this sport, the the camaraderie, it, I tell people this is the only individual sport shot as a team. <laughs> Your scores are individual, but when you're in a squad of four or five people, everybody's bumping knuckles and saying great job. It doesn't matter if you're in the same class you are or not. Right. Right. Well, you know, it's funny, Don, because if you think back, we met in 2020 at the Ohio state shoot. Yeah. And if we would have, when I say we, I mean, Sean and I, if we would have done what we used to do, which was shoot and go home, I would have never met you because we met during the shoot offs. We were standing around watching the shoot offs. And you know, that was that, that was in August of 2020 it was before we started this podcast or it was even a thought. And, you know, there was really no reason for us to hang around. It's like, Oh, you know, well, let's just watch some shoot offs and look at all the people we met, you know, Absolutely. and it's just, it's just continued that over the years. And the amount of people there, were, like you said, the camaraderie, the friendships, the relationships that are built, even through business sometimes just hanging out to shoot, you know, especially me now that I'm in the, you know, the clay target world as far as my business goes. Um, but you know, I just gave a lesson to a guy yesterday and he, he tried going out and doing the fishing thing for the longest time and even a little bit of competition fishing. And he said, you want to talk about cold shoulder? You go over and ask somebody, how you, you know, what are you guys using to catch fish? Fishing poles. <laughs> well, what kind of bait hooks? You know, they don't, they will not tell you. It's a big secret. Yep. You know, and I would say you can go up to anybody. You don't want to do it. I, I really incur or discourage asking for help during a tournament. Um, but you can go up to any one of these pros after the tournament and, you know, they can give you a lesson or you can ask them a question. They'll answer your question. Um, but, I mean, it's it's just such a different community. And, Sean, I'm kind of kind of agree but disagree at the same time with your statement earlier about – some of the no, I don't think there is any finer group of people than you'll find in a sporting clay course. I don't think there's a golf club. I don't think there's a tennis and also the crap that people do for recreation. I don't think you'll find a country club anywhere with as inviting and friendly people as you will at a sporting clay course. That's just my thought. I'm not going to disagree on that. I mean, there are some very, very fine people. And what's also amazing is how many of those people are willing to help you. I mean, you don't know them from Adam, but if you go out and squad with somebody, like Don said, you go out and squad with somebody that you don't know, you'll be amazed that by the end of the rotation, you've got their name, you've got their number, you probably got their email address, and then you're trying to plan to shoot with them at, at, at another date in the future. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, hey, Don, I'm going to switch it a little bit. Um, let's talk about some equipment. I think one of the first things I would change is I would not have tried to shoot shoulder wrecking ammo. And you know what I'm talking about. The ounce and a 1350 cannon loads. Uh, unfortunately, a buddy of Sean and I still, uh, the only reason he shoots ounce and eighth, cause he's not allowed to shoot ounce and a quarter. And the only reason he shoots two and three quarters, cause he's not allowed to shoot three inch mags. So, um, he, I, I don't know. He feeds off of that, you know, the recoil. <laughs> he likes recoil, but, uh, he likes recoil. but what do you think, Don? Did you kind of make some of those same mistakes in the beginning with, with, uh, with ammo? Yeah, I mean, you're always trying to find that advantage. You know, what, what what's going to help me break more targets? So, I mean, it's always I mean, everything in your equipment um, is you're questioning everything. And when you stop and think about, you know, well, 1350 versus 1150, you know, 200 feet per second, that's going to make a big difference on the long boom and targets. I have shot the fast targets. I have shot the slow target, the, the fast loads, the slow loads. I've shot them all. Number eights, ounce and eighths, uh, one ounce, seven and a halves. And it's not necessary to have the sh- shoulder thump in 1350 ounce and an eighth number eights. It, it just, the targets break just as easy, just as well. Um, I have broke 80 yard targets using uh, one ounce number eights at 1235. So, you put the gun in the right spot, it's going to break targets. And I think there was an article in Clay Target Nation magazine, just this last one, that addressed that. Um, but you have people that will say, well, I want the faster ones because they get there faster. I don't have to worry about lead so much. Well, if you're worried about lead, you're not doing it right to begin with. So it just, yeah, the ammo is one of them that I started out, but then I just settled in. And most generally, I shoot one ounce, number eights at about 1235. And if I get something that's going to be a real big boomer out there, I'll throw in seven and a half. But other than that, I just carry one shell in my bag. Other than for rabbits, I will carry a spreader. Yep. And let me let me go off off on that just a little bit, Don, because here's another thing that I don't know if you're guilty of it, but I was guilty of it as well. You know, when you're new and you're getting into the game, well, it can't be that it's your shooting ability that's causing a problem. It must be the shell. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I need to I need to buy those super high expensive you know, top tier professional target shotgun shells that are twice the price of what I can buy at Walmart or wherever, right? Because that's going to help me break more birds. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and it, it, Exactly. You know, you can spend $120 a flat or you can spend $90 a flat, but you're still going to break the targets at 45 yards no matter which ones you use. So pick your ammo. Some of the ammo manufacturers are going to argue with us and be upset with this. You know that, right? Oh, we we know, we know. But I, I mean, back in those days, you could go get a cheap flat of uh, you know the the white box Winchesters or the the Federals for what Jay about forty five fifty bucks a flat, uh, yeah, even less it, if you shopped. Right, right, and then uh, but then you were still paying you know seventy eighty maybe ninety bucks for the high dollar double A's the the game bores the. Uh, the Fiokis and that kind of stuff. Um, but you did, you, you know, as a beginning shooter, save your money. Uh, you don't need it. Um, and I would say you have to get well along in your shooting career before you can really justify trying to spend that kind of money. I know a lot of our, our guys are not going to agree with me on that, or a lot of our <laughs> shell manufacturers might not like me saying that, but I'm just saying, if you're starting out fresh, save your money, buy the budget shells, and learn your mechanics, learn to be a better shooter, then when you feel confident that you uh, you, you know the recipe that you like to shoot, then go ahead and, and upgrade and, and spend the hey, money on it. Uh, listen, Fiocchi makes the, uh, the shooting dynamics. Absolutely. And I've seen, I've seen those shells hammer targets at 80 yards I, I still say to this day it's probably <laughs> the best value shell you can buy anywhere that that is my favorite shell of all time yeah really Abs- yes the fioki shooting dynamics for the money and, i think and, it's the best shell out there yeah and my gun loves them now i have discovered using a patterning board there is a difference um i can put one out seven and a halves in of seven different manufacturers and get seven different patterns. So sometimes you just got to use a patterning board to find out which ones work best with your particular gun and chokes that you're using. But Don, that's later down the road. Don't worry about that up front. Worry about your mechanics, as Sean said. 
I mean, not Sean, yeah. but Jason said, worry about your mechanics, worry about your move, your mount, um, how you're acquiring the targets, your line, um, hole points, break points, visual pickup points, all that stuff is more important than what ammo you're using Amen. in the beginning. Amen. Don, you remember, you, have you ever seen those uh, dragon's breath shells? <laughs> I've seen the dragon's breath. You ever heard of the roosters? No. Roosters are like ounce and a half, number fives, and they're got a gel in them. And they're used for shooting like uh, Annie Oakley's where you're shooting third gun at like 90 yards. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. Well, the the, the dragon's breath, when you shoot it, 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 sh- it shoots like a big ball of flame you can see going through the air. And then when it hits something, it like explodes. If somebody would have told Sean that that was the ticket, he would have had a flat of dragon's breath at the next time we went to a tournament. <laughs> a skid. A skid of those. A skid, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, I would love to have a skid of them just to shoot them for fun because I'm kind of a pyro. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sorry, honey. We're not going on a cruise this year. Rambo said this will break targets quicker. <laughs> right, so, right. Right. Um. So another thing too, and you've already talked about this, you've already kind of hit on it, Don, um, but was proper gun fit. Um, you know, I was the first one amongst our group. My dad was still alive at the time. And he's like, you need to go get your gun fit. Cause I remember coming home and like showing him these big bruises all over my chest and shoulder. And he's like, you, I'm like gun fit. What are you, what are you talking about? Well, I went to Eister and he was more or less my neighbor up in Ohio. And, uh, he fit me the first, my first Browning that I had and what a world of difference. And then all of a sudden, you know, of course, Sean and JD, they got to fall suit. So they got their guns fit, but it was, you know, it was night and day. I mean, just going out and practicing, you could see such a difference. It's like, wow, the gun actually shoots where I'm looking and I don't feel like I'm getting hit by a truck. Yeah. But that's, I would say starting off, Don, wouldn't you, that's probably the most important is getting that gun fit. Yeah, I mean, your your sight picture, it's important for your sight picture, point of impact. And I started out shooting a 1951 Browning Superposed. That was my first sporting clays gun. Nice. And I could go out and shoot 200 rounds, and I would feel like I was beat to death. Oh, I bet. When I got my, uh, my Caesar Greeny, um, the guy I bought it from fit it to me, adjusted the comb, everything else, and I felt like... To this day, I can shoot four or five hundred rounds in a day, and my shoulder doesn't feel it one bit. So, gun fit is extremely important. Not only for it, it doesn't beat up your cheek, it doesn't bruise your shoulder. Um, because once it starts doing stuff like that, then you start flinching, you start closing your eyes because you're expecting the recoil and the pain. But yes, definitely, gun fit is huge. Get a gun that fits you right, and it doesn't beat you to death. But then again, or at least get your gun fit that you have. Some people well, can't afford to go out and buy a new gun. I, I think the best statement I ever heard was gun manufacturers build the gun to fit nobody. Uh, and if you think about that, out of the box, has anybody really taken a gun out of the box that fit them with no adjustment to it? Probably not. I mean, Sean, look, you're a big old boy, and you should really be chiming in here because your gun fit made huge strides for you and your shooting. Oh, absolutely. And I think that, you know, even more importantly than the gun that you shoot is whether or not the gun you were shooting fits you. Um, and, it, and everybody's a little bit different. I mean, your height, your weight, the size of your chest, how you hold the gun in your pocket, uh, your you length know, of pull, your length of pull. I mean, all that stuff is so critical. And I think that too many people, uh, get into this sport and they have a hunting gun. And again, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, you can, you can take out a, a semi-automatic, you know, hunting gun, uh, black uh, synthetic stocks and all that stuff and go shoot sporting clays. But if you don't work on getting the gun fit exactly for you, I think you're doing yourself a huge disservice because you, the game will be more enjoyable. Your results will be more positive. Uh, if I could say anything to anybody, you know, cheap gun, that fits you better than an expensive gun that does not fit you. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you can get a gun as long as it doesn't beat you. To, I have seen people that have a gun that, that doesn't beat them to death and their, their pupil is like a good inch over top of the rip. 
Mm. And I look at him and go, you got to be floating that target like crazy. You can learn to shoot a gun like that, but it takes a lot longer than what it does for a gun that fits you. Well, if you're David or Dulovich, you set the gun up like that because your head never comes near the stock. <laughs> you use the force. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Right, so, right. Um, so another thing I got down here, and going to come back around to you on this one here, Sean, um, not understanding what real practice or training is. When we got into tournaments, we thought that practice and training was going and shooting around with your buddies. And then when we learned that that was way wrong – we still didn't quite, I mean, look, how many times would we go out to whatever range we were going to that day, Sean, and you would go, well, what do you want to work on today? You know, you should have already had an idea of what we were going to do before you got out there. You should already know what you wanted to do. Oh, a- on, amen. Right? I mean, amen. so, I mean, not understanding what real practice or training is, I think that was huge. Well, and I think there's also, again, depending on your level of experience, you don't know what you don't know. So you have to be aware of, first of all, where your problems lie. If you don't have a coach early on to point those things out, you're just guessing and spitballing. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I have trouble right. on 70 yard Shondells. Well, most people do. You know, it's it's the little 15, 20 yard simple shots that you're missing uh, and wondering, well, I should have hit that. Well, why did you miss? I mean, you have to have an understanding, uh, again, of basic mechanics, uh, how to properly read targets, and how to understand your gun movement and how it affects how you're shooting at the target before you can even go out and train properly on your own. So again, going back to the whole coach thing, this is where a coach can come in and shave lots of time off of your experimenting out in the field. Don, what are your thoughts? Absolutely. Back when I first started, I'm, I'm still in the DeLorean. Back when I first started, my idea of practicing was going to the local club and shooting a full round of 100 targets <laughs> and then looking at my scorecard to see if I did better than the last time I was there. That was my idea it, of practice. Exactly. Yep. Guilty. Yeah. Guilty. No. Yeah. No. My idea of practice now, here comes the plug, is when I go to a regional or something like that and they throw a target that I have a difficulty with, takes me a while to find it, I come home with my Atlas Traps. There's the plug. I set them up exactly like what I was shooting with, and then I practice it. And then I move around, and I practice some more, and I move around, and I practice some more. If I was to tell somebody, you know, it's, it's hard to get a local club to set up targets to replicate what you shot at a regional. You, sometimes you can if they're not busy. They'll work with you, and they'll set up a stand the way you want it to be. But if you're going to go to the club, and you're going to shoot around, and you find a station that you're struggling with, don't keep going. Stay at that station, work at it for a while, see if you can't figure out what's going on. And until you can break it 10 times in a row, don't move on. Stay right there. Right. Well, and, you know, credit to Chad Roberts, um, you know, the homework that he gave Sean and I uh, from the very beginning. I mean, the way he broke down training and different aspects of training and different, you know, it was incredible. And it was like, when I, the first time I read that, that he had sent me that material, I was like, wow, I really have been pointing around blindly, you know, as far as training goes. So yeah, definitely a coach is going to help get you, you know, pointed in the right direction for training. Absolutely. And a coach will help you if you have a problem with a certain target presentation, a coach will help you know how to acquire that target, how to find it, and how to take it. Where, just like I mentioned earlier, just continue to keep shooting at it and shooting at it until you figure it out on your own. It takes longer. The coach is going to get you there faster. Absolutely. Right. Um, The the last thing I have down here, and we kind of touched on this uh, towards the beginning, is I would have been more willing to random squad with people or even be squatted with people in master class There's so much you can learn without ever bothering them, without ever asking a question, without ever crowding them, just watching the way that they shoot. Now, you can stand behind Zach, and he's going to take a target different than Brandon Powell would. You know, but understanding what they're doing and paying attention, it's amazing what you can learn just by watching someone shoot. And, you know, if you're on a squad with them, be polite, be respectful, don't bother them while they're shooting, but just 
being observant can speak volumes. You know, you can learn tremendously. Um, Don, I'm sure you probably had an experience the first time you shot with a big name pro. You probably learned a lot shooting with them on their squad, right? Yeah, I did actually. I learned more about the mental side of it than I did the actual target acquisition. And even I think the very first pro that I ever shot with on a squad was Wendell Cherry. And it was so amazing to watch him and his mental side of the game. It, it just, it was great to watch that. Now, as far as target acquisition and stuff, it was hard for me to see you know, at that time, because I was still young in the sport, you know, is he doing a swing through? How is he taking this target? Is he, you know, diminishing lead, uh, intercept? What's he doing? Uh, I didn't understand that then. But what amazed me was the mental side. Um, now I've shot with other pros since then, and I'm able to watch them acquire targets. But sometimes I've learned this as well. Sometimes acquiring your tactics to take a target is going to change over time. A lot of people say, well, I shoot maintain lead. Well, if you stand behind them and watch them, they don't always shoot maintain lead. It's more of a diminishing lead. Um, sometimes it's a swing through if the target beats them. But you've got to learn all of them. And that's what I tell people. on a, a springing teal, it can be swing through. It can be all different kinds of things. Practice them all. Learn them all. Don't be afraid of any one particular tactic for taking a target. Because the target setters are going to understand what a normal person is going to do to take a target, and they're going to throw you off balance. Oh, yeah. So don't be afraid to learn all of that stuff. Um, but, yeah, in the beginning, watching the pros, you know, once I stopped drooling, I, I did learn a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Sean? What was your first experience shooting with a big-name person? You don't have to name the person, but... Well, I mean, like everybody's been saying here, if you're if you're attentive... Again, don't bother them. But if you start watching the top-level shooters, they're all fairly consistent in what they do and how they do it. Um, they all have some kind of a pre-shot routine, whether it's a short pre-shot routine or if you're David or Wendell and it takes all day to get your <laughs> get your gun up to your shoulder. Um, but you know that's important. Uh, how they stand in the box, how they how they kind of you can actually watch them kind of in their mind going through how they're going to move their body, how they're going to attack the target. Uh, I think that's super, super important. And then also seeing what they do in between shots, like on a true pair or something like that, or even on a report pair, how they move from one target to the other. Where are their hold points? Where are their break points? And then start thinking about why they're choosing those hold points, why they're choosing those break points. Are they, you know, I used to take, Jason, you know how I shot and you were the same way. We were very aggressive and tried to take targets very, very early on. And these days, I realize that, uh, you know, patience pays off. If you can wait for the opportune time when the tar, if you have that opportunity to let it slow down to where you can see it the most clear, where the target looks the biggest to you, uh, that, that is, that pays huge dividends and, and trying to rush, trying to blow up, blow a target up, you know, 20 feet, 30 feet out of the trap. It's cool and all, don't get me wrong. And when you're younger, you have better eyes, better reflexes, and you can do that. But as you get older, you know, patience is key. Uh, and, and then at the end, you know, the post-shot routine, a lot of them will kind of look at things. They'll If they miss a target, watch what they do. After they miss a target, do they get mad? Do they throw shells? Most of them do not. Uh, there's just a lot you can learn just from observing somebody that shot the game for many, many years and somebody that shoots it well. Don, did we did we cover everything that you wanted to cover? I mean, I know you had some of your own personal notes there. Did we leave anything out before we move on? Uh, yeah, you pretty much did. Um, I guess the big thing is, is just, you know, don't fly into this willy nilly and think, well, if I, if I buy this gun, it's going to make me shoot better. Or if I use these chokes, I'm going to shoot better because so-and-so uses them and they shoot so well. You know, if, if I do this, I'm going to shoot better because so-and-so does it and they do better. Um, do, do a lot of research. Uh, yeah, I did a ton of research before I did anything simply because I've got limited funds and I had to be careful about where I put money at. Um, that's just the big thing. And be patient. And John's big thing. Don't chase the punches. You know, it, it's this is supposed to be fun. And I chased masterclass hard. Mm -hmm. 
And when I got there, I was like, oh, what do I do now? Right. Um, you know, you hear people saying all the time, well, that's the donor class. That's why I got out of sporting claims. Well, I, I don't tend to believe that. I'm still competitive. I'm still competing. I'm still having fun. And I set new goals. So it's all about fun. Just remember fun. Yep. I agree. Absolutely. Um, hey, Sean, something just occurred to me. Don, when we had you on before, did we do a rapid fire with you? No, you did not. Well, it guess was pretty what, much just to talk about the Atlas traps. I think. It, yeah. Well, 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 guess what's about to happen, my friend. <laughs> it's been a minute since we've done a rapid fire, Jay. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna put him through his paces here. Okay. All right, Don. Let's talk about this. What gun do you shoot? Caesar Guarini Invictus One Ascent. Thirty-two inch barrels. Thirty-two inch barrels. Ported? No, sir. Uh, screw in or fixed choke? Screw in. What brand of chokes? Comp and chokes. Comp and chokes. Uh, do you have a go-to constriction that you stick with? Mod and improved mod. Okay. Uh, what brand is, oh wait, uh, custom stock or factory stock? It is a factory stock, but it has an adjustable comb. Okay. Uh, shells. What, what brand do you like? I love Fiocchi's. And what's your favorite recipe? I like, to be honest with you, they are (laughs) absolutely, a buddy of mine calls me whammy because I shoot the ounce and eighth number eights, 1235s and anything 45 yards and in just absolutely obliterates them. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Uh, what glasses do you use? I use Rangers, the AIs. Very nice. Are you using the edge or are you using the, uh, the, the frame that Sean uses? What's your frame, Sean? Falcons. Falcons. Are you using the Falcons or the edge? Uh, I think I'm using the Falcons. They were the original ones that first came. Well, I couldn't tell you. Are they one piece lens? Are they one piece lens or two, pe- two separate lenses? One piece lens. Okay, that's the that's yeah. the Falcons, yeah, the Falcons. Um, okay, what uh, what ear protection? Um, <laughs> I use Gray Sturdivant. Oda Pro. There you go. Yeah, there, there you go. go. Are you using the Sound Gear Phantoms? The electronics? No, I because I've got an Android phone. They didn't work out so well, so I stepped down. If I had an okay. iPhone, I I they would have worked out great, but I stepped down. Okay. Um, vest or shell bag. Uh, either one, depending on the weather and my mood, but most generally because I shoot with a Caesar Greeny Pro Staff shirt, I normally just use a shell pouch rather than the vest. Okay. Any specific brand? Uh, Caesar Greeny. Okay. I love their shell pouch because it's got a spot for the choke tubes, choke wrench, uh, two different kinds of shells, all kinds of good stuff. Okay, and then what's in your bag? We're looking for that lucky rabbit's foot, something strange, something weird, something different that people might not know that, or might not think to carry. Well, it's not really in my bag, but some you may have seen some of them at the last couple of shoots, the Jack Links and the Southeast Regional. It's a cross-stitched heart that looks like an American flag that my mom made. And it's because of the heart issues I was having. My mom made a few of them. I handed some of them out. I didn't see you long enough to get you one, Jason. We just yes, you did. And second time, did I give you one? Yep, you gave me you gave me one. And actually, my daughter wears it to school every day. Awesome. That is my good luck charm. Makes me think of my mom. Uh, so that's that's my go-to. Well, I I I told the story to my daughter and. She pinned it to her backpack with she's she's got a she's silly she's got a keychain collection, and she pinned it to her backpack and it's with her every day. She takes it to school. She's proud of it. So well, you and I need to have a conversation after the podcast is over because I can send you probably about fifteen to twenty other ones, including little animals and everything else. Awesome, very cool, awesome. Um, well, you know, everyone, the, the point of this podcast is if you're a newer shooter. We're hoping that you take some of this to heart. You're not making the mistakes that we did uh, on the way up, and you can learn from our mistakes. Um, You know, if you are a veteran shooter, maybe you're scratching your head thinking, wow, I still do some of that stuff. Maybe I need to (laughs) change my way of thinking a little bit, you know. Um, But, Don, I'm going to run through our sponsor list, and I think some of our sponsors coincide here. I think you might be able to chime in on this. Uh, There's a few plugs in there, I think. Yeah, uh, Elite Shotguns. Uh, again, they carry Susie Greeny. Um, yep. 
We hope we hope that Don comes to his senses and buys a Kohler. But until then, that's all right. Nobody's perfect, Don. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> um, uh, of course, Fiocchi, uh ammunition. We love us some Fiocchi. and you know Don uh, here enjoys, uses, loves Fiocchi. Um, Rhino chokes. Hey, quick story about this. No lie, I set up. Uh, just we were practicing. We we're screwing around. I set up a target out at blackjack and i was shooting with bruce potter the general manager there and this target from the stand to the trap we shot it with a a vortex range finder with 67 yards the break zone and the apex of the flight was 92 yards bruce took his caller rhino ported and put a set of 22s in, and I mean, was just absolutely vaporizing this target. I'm like, ah, oh, man, that's awesome. He's like, well, let's see what the 17s do. Still crushed it. Sean Alley, he put that new 12 in and was still hammering that target at 92 yards, one ounce load, 1250s with eights. I love 92 that 92 yards. So, big shout out to Rhino. Those, those chokes get it done, whether it's five yards, 50 yards, or... 92 yards. <laughs> right. So, they, they do. They do. Um, Odo Pro Technologies. Uh, Don, again, uh, loves Dr. Grace. What was your experience like, Don? Because if, if you remember correctly, you text me and you said, hey, is this legit? Is this for real? And I told you, you're going to love working with her. What's, your, what's been your experience with Dr. Grace? Uh, her and her staff were absolutely amazing. Um, I sent her an email and she asked me when it was a good time to call. She called me. We talked on the phone. Uh, she set me up with somebody locally that could do the ear molds and we sent them off and it was in no time at all. I had the hearing protection. I did have a problem with one of them. I reached out to her. She said, send it back. And they sent me a brand new pair. It was absolutely amazing. They're so attentive and nice and customer service is amazing. Best in the business. Best. Yeah, absolutely. 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 And they work perfectly. Well, that's important that they fit and they work, right? And that's the whole purpose of them. So that's awesome. Well, I have to tell you, I kind of messed up in the beginning. You know, I wanted to be able to hear everything. So I turned them up. Man, did I hear everything. That was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear the crickets yelling at each other 30 yards away, right? In the woods. <laughs> yeah, I could. I could. Um. RE Ranger, uh, the Ranger reacts, uh, all three of us use them. Uh, of course, I'm using Prescription Edge. Uh, Sean and Don are both using the Falcons. I, You know, I just can't get people to understand the difference between the standard lens and the AI lens. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Don, what was your experience the first time you started using them? Uh, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, I used to wear Pila's. And, you know, I would carry five and six lenses and I'd be swapped around in lenses. I carry three lenses now. And if it's overcast, I use the yellow. If it's, you know, sunlight, other than on the sand, I use the mid-grade. And I use the darker lens if I'm shooting in Florida over top of sand or Arizona. They are amazing. Absolutely amazing. When I'm shooting, I've got people that say, I didn't even see that target. It was really bad at Southeast Regional. There were some targets hard to see with the lighting late in the day. And I handed them my my rangers and i said here watch this they put them on and went oh my goodness i could see the target i said absolutely well and another one and this is one of the reasons why don and i met uh atlas traps um don you were inquiring about the 30 watt solar panels versus the older 20 watt panels and and i took you over to one of my traps that was there at hillendale Uh, and showed you the 30-watt panel. Next thing you know, you're ordering a couple of AT-150s, which has now been replaced by the 200. And you you were someone that really went above and beyond. Like, you were posting videos of the the wild and crazy extreme angles you could throw with an Atlas trap. Absolutely. I can throw a regular standard target on the ground like a rabbit without putting wood blocks under the wheels, and it won't break targets. Um as it's throwing them. I can tilt that machine all the way back and throw them straight up in the air. It feeds them great. I have no issues. I have six of the AT-150s. All of them have solar panels on them, and I've never had an issue. And they've thrown thousands of targets. 
Sean, I think I told you about that. Don called, called me and he ordered two. And then the next thing you know, there was two more coming. And then there was two more coming. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the man found the value in them for sure. Never enough of a good thing, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, of course, Don Grant, uh, she she does her best to keep Sean and I in line. And I know it's a full-time job for her. And I'm sorry, I know you have other clients, Don. But uh, you got two basket cases on your hands. So. Poor gal. Um, but now she's, we, we love Don Grant. She, she does an amazing job. And if you're, you're looking for a mental coach, I, I absolutely, without a doubt, I recommend Don. So, yep, yep. um, Vero beach clay shooting sports, home of the dead pair blast home of the Caribbean cup. Don, we sure hope to see you down in December, uh, at the dead pair blast. If you can make it, sir. I mean, I know you have a busy schedule, but we sure would love to have you down. That's for sure. Well, I threw it on my calendar, and a lot's going to depend. I've got a company meeting. I'm not sure if it's the first week or second week of December, but we'll have to see. Well, uh, I tell you what, to be there. I, t- I tell you what we'll do. You talk to the boss, and if he's a drinker, we're going to send him a bottle of Taconic Distillery's fine, fine bourbon, and we're going to convince him to throw it the opposite weekend of the Dead Pair of Blast, so that way you can come down and join us. I like where your head's at, Jason. I like where your <laughs> yes. head's at. So thank you to Conic Distilleries. I think we just picked up another participant at the Dead Pair Blast. <laughs> so, and of course, Don, when you're ready to sign up, after you've got the boss good and drunk and you've convinced him to switch weekends, you're going to do it on Score Chaser, aren't you, Don? Absolutely. We, we love us some Casey Chase with Score Chaser. Big shout out to her. I was a literally a last minute entry to the Southeast Regional. And she got me in. She she hooked me up. So thank you, Casey, and all the girls at, at uh, Score Chaser. They do an amazing job for us, for sure. Heck yeah. yeah. The way they work things at uh, the Southeast Regional when they had the rain delay, it got all the schedules back out the door and everything else. was I mean, It was unbelievable. Phenomenal. Yeah, they they overcame a lot of adversity there, for sure. That was, uh, that was a wet one. I think I heard... One report was like seven inches. The next report was like nine inches of rain or something in, in, a, in a real short window. So, yes, they, they overcame a lot real quick. Sean Alley, what do you think about all this, bud? Uh, this has been a, a very enlightening podcast, hopefully to a lot of people. Yeah, we've definitely uh, talked about this many, many times over the years. Uh, you know, if we could go back and do it all over again, what would we do differently? And I think we've covered pretty much most of the important stuff uh, that's going to mean the most to a new shooter. Uh, Don, anything that we left out that you can think of? No, no. Uh, the only thing I can think of is, guys, is I know you hear it all the time, and it's said from the heart. I love what you guys do. What you're doing is great. Uh, you're an asset for the sport, and I love seeing you guys out there on the courses. Thank you so much for what you do. Heck, yeah. And you're awesome, too, Don. We always look forward to seeing you and talking with you. It's always a good yeah. time. Don, it's been too long. We need to we need to squat up and shoot together, man. It's it's been way too long. Using Sean's word, threaten me with a good time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is what we tell everybody, and I'm stealing it from Sean because he's not taking it. He's not running with it. Take someone new shooting. Take them to a tournament. You're gonna make great friends, just like Mr. Don Pageant on the line here with us. Um, you know, we push and push every week, and it's for a good reason. Uh, don't forget about the dead pair challenge. You should be taking one new shooter a month out shooting. Uh, don't forget to send us those pictures and videos of you and your newfound shooting partner out on the range. Uh, post them up on the dead pair public group page or on Instagram. Uh, real easy to find. Uh, we'd love to see, we'd love to see your, uh, your mission statement coming to fruition there, Mr. Alley. Absolutely. And don't forget about our new scoop segments that's come out, uh, intermittently here on YouTube. Uh, we've done two so far, uh, trying to time those with uh, major shoots or major events so we can talk a little bit about that and also have uh, guests on to talk about their opinions and thoughts on uh, those events. Uh, check us out. Uh, we'll be announcing the, the new ones probably coming up on our Dead Pair uh, Facebook page, right, Jay? Yeah, just keep an eye on social media. Um, I try to post them in enough time that everybody can join us. If you can't join us live, you can't join in the co- on the conversation. You can always go back and watch it um, after it's aired. It automatically records to YouTube. But the the thought process is here is to get people to interact. You can send questions, make comments. I want to see range owners, uh, range managers, target setters, everybody the, and the like join us. So that way 
you know, we can have some constructive criticism. We can talk about what we've heard from the shoots and try and make things better. Absolutely. Well, hey, listen, until next week, Mr. Alley. We can't wait to see y'all back here on the Dead Pair Podcast. We'll see you next time on the Dead Pair Podcast. The Dead Pair. The Dead Pair Podcast is brought to you by Elite Shotguns and Vero Beach Clay Shooting Sports and is fueled by Fioki USA. The Dead Pair theme song was written, arranged, and produced by Toby Tomplay. Big thanks to the following sponsors. RE Ranger, Odo Pro Technologies, Rhino Chokes, Don Grant, Score Chaser, Taconic Distillery, and Atlas Trap Company.